Coming up on Tech News Today, Facebook Spaces merges social and virtual reality for the Oculus Rift. Also, the Samsung Galaxy S8 reviews are out there, and we'll talk about them. Steve Ballmer is financing a way to track government spending, and the EFF says schools aren't being very careful with students' privacy. All that and more coming up next on Tech News Today. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today, episode 1749, recorded Tuesday, April 18th, 2017. This episode of Tech News Today is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. When it comes to the big decision of choosing a mortgage lender, work with one who has your best interest in mind. Use Rocket Mortgage for a transparent, trustworthy home loan process that's completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. Welcome to the show. This is Tech News Today. If this is your first time here, welcome. Oh, we made it. We, the seat right here yeah. is for you. Go yeah. ahead and sit right down Come between on, don't us. Be shy. It won't be weird. Right there. Not okay, weird at we'll all. go sit over there then. That's fine. fine. We understand. They're shy. I'm Megan Maroney. I'm Jason Howell. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's like, what? I don't know where to go. <laughs> because sometimes we just don't say what we're supposed to say. But there you go. And welcome, new viewers and listeners, if there are any of you. <laughs> Top story today. Facebook is holding its annual F8 Developers Conference in San Jose, California. There's always a nice selection of news from the event. Today's no exception. First, Facebook launched the beta version of Facebook Spaces. This is its way of merging its efforts in the social realm that everybody knows and loves, or maybe doesn't, uh, with its efforts in virtual reality. Spaces launches on Facebook's Oculus Rift with the touch controller and allows Facebook users to communicate with friends by voice and including a virtual avatar that actually animates with full body language. Mm -hmm. Is this your future Facebook platform of choice? I don't Megan? know. I find it incredibly creepy, actually. Oh, okay. it, so, no. <laughs> they, he talked about the emotion <sighs> engine. Mm. It humanizes your avatar by analyzing your body language, mm -hmm. analyzing your eyeballs in real time, and then it blinks in the fashion that you might blink. Yeah. I, this is the I, future. Right I don't there. know. Well, I, I really am more curious because you are not a fan of Facebook and yet you are a big fan of VR. So yeah. would this suck you back in to mm. the Facebook world? I don't know if it would. Maybe we'll see where it develops to. Not right now, not this early stage. Um, well, it doesn't but, exist yet, right? Or it does. The, it does yeah, it it's, it's exists in a beta form right If you now. have the so Oculus. If you have the and Oculus. The touch. Uh, it's possible that we'll be, th we'll be showing it off at some point on the network, I don't know about on this show, uh, sometime in the next week or two. So I think you can actually get your hands on it and play around with it in beta form. Uh, I mean, it's interesting. Like they first, uh, Mark Zuckerberg first showed this off, I believe it was last year. It was mm -hmm. a year ago on, on stage, Facebook's F8. Mark Zuckerberg has made no bones about the fact that he believes that VR is the next major computing platform and that their investment in Oculus and their push behind Oculus, even though VR's demand hasn't quite met up with kind of their ambitions, like this is going to be a long-term thing in the next five or 10 years. Yeah, he said it. And he's willing, yeah, he's willing to stick to that. And when they showed that off last year on stage, you know, the question was like, how early is this aspect and are they going to develop this out for a few years before you ever end up seeing it? So it's, I find it kind of interesting that they're uh, going with it right now, but I think this positions Facebook to be so early on in this next phase, you know, computing platform, if social does in fact move into the virtual space. And we've seen, I think we've actually talked about some apps, at least on mobile VR mm -hmm. that do this. V time is one of those apps where you can enter a virtual world and actually have a voice chat with three other people. And mm -hmm. I've done that before. And yeah, it is kind of weird. It's, it's like, on one hand, you're just having a voice call conversation with people. But on the other hand, you're immersed in this kind of world because you have the mask on. And you actually see a, rep, a, vis, a digital representation of that person you're talking to kind of with all the hand motions and, and like you say, expressions and stuff. So, but I have no doubt to, that that's probably part of the future like that. That'll be a I, I don't know if it'll be the thing 
in the future, but it'll definitely be an avenue that people choose to go. Well, surely, I mean, he's aiming, like Facebook is aiming at a different audience with this, right? Like mm -hmm. people like not, you know, people who love Facebook and spend a lot of their time on Facebook as opposed to people who spend a lot of time gaming. So this is sort of maybe aiming at a different, uh, a different group of people that might buy an Oculus. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, yes, it seems very odd to like be sitting in a room with someone, whether they be like a virtual stranger. But when you think about it, is it any odder than the fact that like we communicate on Facebook sometimes with people that are really strangers. Like we might have gone to fifth grade with them mm -hmm. or they might be like our cousin's next door neighbor or, you know, they're, they're not people that we really, um, you know, no, think of as someone that really has any idea what's going on in our regular life. Right. And yet we interact with them, wish them happy birthday or, you know, say like, it, that's weird when you think about it too. Yeah, although there is the... The, the, like there are different levels of weird, right? Because like at least on Facebook with someone that you vaguely know that maybe you went to school with or whatever, you're dropping a comment and you move on. And in the internet parlance, we're very used to doing that even with people we absolutely don't know, let's say on forums or whatever. Mm -hmm. So there's that kind of that kind of level of comfort in that regard. We're used to not knowing people well, yet still communicating with them with just text. Mm -hmm. You go into something like this, you're forced into a very personal conversation like you're using like w once you start using your voice and talking mm -hmm. to that person you went to school with in fifth grade and you're not actually seeing them but you're seeing their virtual avatar that would be kind of weird right because then it's like yeah do i have enough to talk to you yeah. about right now and but, you use the touch too so you could so you can yeah you, you can, could actually you know, poke them yeah you could do that uh you can ch you can draw you can watch 360 degree videos together make messenger calls take vr selfies which they showed off last year on stage mm -hmm. Um, so anyways, there you go. Free download and early access section of Oculus store right now. If you want to check it out, uh, Facebook also spent some time on augmented reality by showing off its new Facebook AR platform, something Zuckerberg calls the first mainstream AR platform, uh, with AR Zuckerberg posits, uh, that perhaps many of the things in our home, just as one example, could instead be represented virtually that they didn't need to be there physically in the first place. Zuckerberg showed off the camera effects developer platform as well for filters a la slap, uh, Snapchat, Slapchat. That would be a good one. Uh, because the first AR platform uh, will be using a camera and he says not fancy glasses that augment everything we see. Like we already have augmented reality and it's the camera on our phone mm -hmm. and adding dimension to that, which Snapchat's been doing for a little while. Now. Right, yeah. And they, um, you know, they, they did it more today. Like they added uh, yeah. filters today, which kind of got, I and mean, no one was really paying attention uh, because of what Facebook was doing. Mm -hmm. I I mean, the, the augmented reality, the camera effects platform is what they're calling it. That is endlessly fascinating to me. Um, I don't I don't know why, but I, I enjoy taking the Snapchat selfie filters and it just makes selfies more fun, I think. If that didn't exist, you probably wouldn't be using Snapchat at all. So there's value there, right? It's it's a certain category that pulls mm -hmm. in people that might not use the other tools inside the communication mm -hmm. platform. Yeah. You know what I mean? If those didn't did not exist, I would not be using Snapchat at all. Yeah. That is so, the truth. So it's really good for them to have that. And uh and to get back to what I mentioned earlier about representing things in your home that you might not actually need, which is kind of a silly thought personally, if you think about it. So what, am I going to exist in my life always wearing these goggles that are augmenting everything I see? Maybe that's the future future, but that's nowhere, nowhere soon. The example, you know, one of the examples would be like, why spend a thousand dollars for a big screen TV on your wall when, if you're wearing, you know, mm -hmm. augmented goggles, let's say a $1 app could easily represent that and mm -hmm. it would be as believable. So maybe well, that's the future. I that think. was the promise of HoloLens, right? Yeah. Like, you know, Netflix on your wall. Yeah. What I would like is, yeah, more devices to be um, part of augmented reality. Like, you know, just the minority report just, zoop, here's my screen, I'm typing on it. Or maybe when we're born, there is an AR layer implanted into our eyeballs so we don't have to wear anything extra. It's just always there. That's smart. Let's do that. Let's uh -huh. do that Re for real scary. this time. If, isn't that a, that's a Black Mirror episode. It's got to be. And if it's yes. not, it will be. Yeah, let's do that. I know we yeah. had to plan to do something last week. I can't even remember what it was, but let's, let's, do, let's that. do that. Let's yeah. implant uh, eyeball cameras. Cool. Facebook also announced new features in its bot and messaging platform. David Marcus, the head of Facebook messaging, says the company's aim is to become the yellow pages of bots. There was much fanfare about bots last year at F8, but those of us who tried some of the offerings that they offered on stage last year were less than pleased 
when we found them in reality. Uh, Marcus says the growing pains are behind them and that bots are about to become mainstream. He talked about translation bots to help refugees, homework bots to help kids learn, medical bots that could help you diagnose that persistent itch you've been experiencing. Hey. All. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> okay, go. We're, yeah, you we go. weren't going to talk about that on this <laughs> okay, show. Right. Uh, I I think th those things that he said in his uh, PR blog post were all well and good, but I have yet to see a bot from Facebook that's that's that good. Yeah, I mean, well, and you know, they they talked about it. David Marcus for Facebook admitted that calling bots a beta last year actually ended up being a very good thing because it was kind of half-baked. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the AI just was poor in many of the cases. Interactions weren't very believable or kind of up to up to par. Um, and now things that these improvements are going to move bots into the next phase. Uh, chat extensions for one, which basically brings bots into group chats for collaboration, uses things like building a playlist together. Wow. Um, you know, things, things like that, that take the emphasis off of just you interacting with a bot and the whole time wondering, you know, like analyzing it as if it's not human enough and more in a group setting where the bot is uh, kind of adding substance or value to the, the greater conversations becomes more of a tool, less focus on the bot itself and more on what it's doing for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I haven't really, I haven't really found myself very invested in the bot craze, but maybe that's just because it, it is nascent and it is still developing and maybe it gets to a point to where it makes a whole lot more sense. But I do wonder if it's more like a generational thing. Like, is this just something I don't get because I'm not of the right generation to get it. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I think, um, you know, I don't know. I What I like so far is the artificial intelligence that has like very simple answers. Like I've certainly used that. Uh, the, the app that we talked about on Friday, Digit, the one that helps mm -hmm. you save money. Um, I downloaded that. It's super helpful. Like I will, you know, it'll just every day text me, here's the balance in your checking account. And, you know, if I texted a, a emoji of an umbrella, it texts back with how much money I've saved. So it's just, they're not a person on the other end of the line, but I'm not asking, like I can say simple words. So I wouldn't mm -hmm. necessarily call that a bot. Like we're not having a conversation, but it's like, I want simple things from it and it gives me simple things back. Yeah. And I mean, and, and actually what, while we're talking about this, I mean, I fully realize like I use Google home at home. I talk to my phone. I'm using bots. I'm just not using messaging bots, mm -hmm. you know, and there are maybe that that's the, the point is that there are certain contexts where bots make more sense for some people than others. And for me going into Facebook messenger and thinking of that as being the place that I do these things just doesn't make a whole lot of sense mm -hmm. to me. So they're going to have to really build this out more and prove that to me. Mm -hmm. Me. They're going to have to think about me. Yeah, I don't love Facebook Messenger. Like I use yeah. it to communicate with people who that's the only way that I can communicate with them. People right. or groups. I just don't like, I, I don't know. Like I wouldn't say like I love being on iMessage, but I kind of do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like hey, I feel hey. more comfortable communicating there. It's just not messy. They're not throwing all this stuff at me. Um, I, I don't know. It's interesting. And like Slack, I like communicating on Slack. It feels more comfortable than Facebook Messenger. I'm purely on Facebook Messenger, not because of all the bots or because I can do like a Snapchat like filter. I don't want to do any of that stuff there. I just want to mm -hmm. communicate and be done with it. But they want to shove all this stuff at me and I'm tired of it. <laughs> that's the, that's like the summary of technology innovation. They just want to mm -hmm. shove all this stuff at you. Do mm -hmm. you like it or do you not? Yeah. Uh, Talk yes. to the hand, Facebook Messenger. Yeah. Both hands. Both of them. Oof. That's when you know it's serious. Both of them. Uh, the NDA has lifted and many sites are publishing their reviews of the Samsung Galaxy S8 and S8 Plus. We don't have one here in the studio, but we have read a lot of these reviews. Here are a few of the common thoughts from the reviews that we've read. Uh, the Infinity display, of course. Many are saying it's the best display they've ever seen on a smartphone, uh, and I don't deny that. I'm really excited to see it. Uh, the size of the device, they say, is unexpectedly slim, even though the larger screen sizes, uh, you know, even though there are these larger screen sizes, uh, the near bezel-less display really kind of slims it down, so it ends up being more usable even in one-handed situations. Uh, the camera, they say, is one of the best on the market. Noticeable improvements thanks to an improved sensor inside, which actually a lot of places are not talking about the improved sensor. It's there, um, but people aren't talking about it for some reason. Uh, but the rear fingerprint sensor, which is placed awkwardly, it's like right next to the rear-facing camera, is easy to miss. It's awkward. 
Um, and then of course there's Bixby, which is Samsung's uh, highly touted digital assistant. Uh, a lot of people just kind of saying it's half baked at launch. And of course we know that Bixby voice is not included at launch. So that makes perfect sense. It's probably half functional uh, because of that. It still summons Bixby features by pressing that button. But I also saw a lot of people say I end up pressing that button when I'm trying to turn the volume down and that keeps happening. That's fun. Yeah, I am interested because you. I know Florence is coming on. Florence Ion is coming yeah. on tonight. And she's going to have one. I'm interested in her review because all the rest of the reviews I've seen about like, oh, it's this size, but it's fine in my hand. Like they're all male reviewers. Oh, like yeah, you know, right. I don't, I don't, you know, I haven't seen Steve Kovac in person, you know, in person. So maybe he has small hands too. But my guess is that most of these men have larger sized hands. So mm -hmm. I'm interested in how it fits in her hand, in a small, delicate female hand. Yeah, so Florence is going to be bringing in the S8, not the S8 Plus. Oh. Uh, maybe we'll be seeing the S8 Plus in person next week. Well, that's what I ordered, and I think I'm supposed to get it on Friday, so almost guaranteed we'll see the S8 Plus at some point next week, and you can have one and see how okay. it compares. It's because you have the larger iPhone. I do, right? I do. And I think I've seen a lot of comparisons between the two and saying it's actually uh, pretty pretty close. If it's perfectly in my hand, nothing has ever fit in my hand as good as this iPhone. <laughs> Except um, for the next one that's, that's going <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so uh, there's also a Snapchat clone inside the camera. Did you know that? Mike Murphy um, did an extensive review. And so they have like not only just face things too, but like it has, you know, uh, augmented reality hands um, that hats. don't like look... Yeah, hats. It's, Convince people that you're wearing amazing. a hat that you're not actually wearing because mm -hmm. it looks totally real. Uh, and portrait mode. Yep, exactly. <laughs> oh, he looks actually sick. He does. Uh, oh, and portrait okay, mode man. in the selfie camera, which my iPhone does not have. Um, <sighs> I think that is also in Mike's article, if you could see that. You know, the little bokeh effect, mm -hmm. which you, you can't do in the iPhone 7 on, on a selfie. Gazing. Um, which, you know, is super important to be able to create selfie portraits well, on a daily basis. One of the things basis. that really imp impressed me when in my time with the iPhone was, mm -hmm. the, was the portrait mode on the rear-facing camera, mm -hmm. for sure. So I would love that. Burke chat. Uh, uh, you're thinking that there might be filters in there for chainsaw arms. I know this is, I know this is something that you're always looking for, Burke, but I'm not quite so sure that it would be in there. We will ask Florence. We will make sure. Tonight on All About Android. 5.30 p.m. Pacific, 8.30 p.m. Eastern, plug. Uh, mm -hmm. Florence Ion will be on and we'll we'll cover the S8. And I will make sure to ask her about chainsaw arms just for you. Well, I uh, I wish you were also talking to Walt Mossberg because his review is one of my favorite because he talks about how beautiful it is. And um, and then he says, you know, um, if you have $750 laying around, go ahead and get it. It won't wow you, but just like, who has $750 sitting around? Well, I mean, the same would be said about an iPhone, right? It's that expensive. Right, but he basically said, like, if you have it laying around, you know, it won't wow you. I mean, okay. this is going to wow you. Like, just it just yeah. is a weird thing to say, right? Yeah, Like, if you got $750 laying around. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't have $750 laying around? I do not. I've got it laying around all on the floor here. <laughs> Burke has $750. <laughs> yes. Burke is money. When he isn't jumping up and down at LA Clippers games or teaching at Stanford uh, and USC, former Microsoft chief executive Steve Ballmer is launching a watchdog site to track government spending. USA Facts will make it easier to understand how the US government is spending your tax dollars that you should have sent in by today. According to CNN, Ballmer wants to release annual reports on the government, much like public companies do. The reports would provide a comprehensive view of the combined U.S. federal, state, and local government's revenues, expenditures, and key metrics, and the factors that might affect future operations. Balmer has hired a team of researchers for the project and has already spent $10 million on it. So he, I mean, Steve Balmer has, you know, $750 laying around, hopefully. $750 million. Or, <laughs> he probably has $750 million. Uh, he, yeah, he, sh he should get that new phone. But but instead, he is doing good with it. I, I, um, I am, I'm interested in this. Balmer was yeah. surprised how difficult it was to find this information, so he just decided to do something about it. Uh, one report that they've already produced is modeled on the Form 10-K that public companies are required to file annually, but the government is not required to to file. So in, in addition to the $10 million he's spending, he's going to, he promised to spend three to $5 million a year on this project. That's awesome. I mean, and it's, and I'm very hard pressed. I've been very hard pressed to see anybody saying anything negative about this. This is, this is somebody who has the resources and the ability 
to do something that is very, I think, very desperately needed right now. And managing all of that information at this level of volume is super costly. Um, kind of surprising that it hasn't been done up until well, now. Well, Open able- Secrets has always been, that's, they've been around forever and yeah. that's, but it's probably not, it's not like this, you mm-hmm. know, it's not like the, they're not hiring the, these, you know, people that are, you know, really, experts. Yeah. Analyzing it and putting, yeah, it, through its, uh, putting it through its paces. Um, but yeah, I, I just, I really hope that the project can sustain itself and keep going. Cause I think. I think now more than ever, you know, the transparency like this is really important and to really understand what's happening with that money. I mean, it's just, it's an important time right now. So knowing that, uh, I'm all for it. Let's top this off with some fun rumory stuff. We were talking just a few moments ago about the upcoming iPhone uh, that we don't know, really know much about. Bloomberg's Mark Gurman and Min Jung Lee uh, have more details on Apple's upcoming 10-year release of the iPhone. Rumors say to expect three new models this fall with two upgraded versions of the currently available model that we have, and then one premium version that everyone's going to go gaga over, I imagine, with a completely overhauled design. Upgrades to that one include curved glass that nearly covers the full front side of the device, resulting in a larger display and a smaller body, similar to what we were talking about with the the S8, uh, as well as merging the home button into the screen. Again, very similar what it sounds like to what Samsung's done with the S8. Uh, so they're all kind of going in a similar direction with a premium device. Uh, premium version will use Samsung OLED instead of LCD. It's a really you know, That'll be a really nice panel. Uh, they're experimenting with a fingerprint sensor being embedded in the screen or possibly moving it to the back in the screen would be really cool. Yeah, but there's rumors that they're having a lot of yeah. trouble with that. I haven't heard that they're putting it on the back, um, but... Yeah, I, I think that... I, not from this report, but yeah. I've heard it from a different one. But I, yeah, I think that I, there was like an investor letter that went out that said, you know, they're having trouble putting this in, you know, on the OLED screen. Would they just get rid of it? I don't couldn't? think they would. I think that's, that's a pretty key, premium feature. Yeah, like, I you think kind of so. That to be there now. So I don't know, but I mean, this is just a rumor, you know, based mm-hmm. on whatever they figure out. You know, they're already in, I guess, you know, beginning production with these. I don't know how it mm-hmm. works exactly, but yeah. So I think um, it it seems like a great phone. Um, these are all all these rumors are have all been rumored th- thrown about already. Mm-hmm. But Mark Gurman saying them makes them a little more substantiated yeah, because we know he has. Yeah, we know he has sources within, uh, you know, Apple and the dual lens selfie um, uh-huh. camera. There, there's that. So I don't need to get the S8 just to make portrait selfies. Right. Apparently. If there if the, if there is the rumored dual lens on the front as well as the back in the upcoming model, then you would get your uh, mm-hmm. portrait mode. On the selfies, which I'll, I think is like the only thing everyone in this world wants. My more we can all portraits, agree on that. More of my portraits on Twitter yeah. of myself. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Don't look now, but somebody is spying on our students. Amul Kalia from the Electronic Frontier Foundation is here to tell us who and how. But first, let's take a minute to thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans, the sponsor of this episode. I wish that I understood how houses could possibly be so expensive, why they cost so much. I mean, most of us have to borrow a lot of money to buy them. In order to do that, you have to turn over a lot of your personal information. And when it comes to the big decision of working with a mortgage lender, it's important to work with someone who you can trust and who has your best interest in mind. With Rocket Mortgage, you'll get a transparent online process that gives you the confidence to make an informed decision. Don't waste time searching through stacks of paperwork. With Rocket Mortgage, you can securely share your financial information to get a mortgage approval in just minutes. You can also adjust the rate and the length of your loan in real time to make sure you get the mortgage solution that's right for you. So work with those sliders until you find out what's best for you. So whether you're looking to buy a home or refinance your existing mortgage, you can lift that burden of getting a home loan with Rocket Mortgage. You don't have to worry about all that stress. Take that out of it and just leave all the stress for thinking about how much money your house costs. Skip the bank, skip the waiting and go completely online at quickenloans.com slash TNT. That's quickenloans.com slash TNT. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS consumeraccess.org number 3030. And we thank Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans for their support. 
According to a new report by the Electronic Frontier Foundation, schools are collecting and storing kids' names, birth dates, browsing histories, location data, and much more without proper privacy protections. Joining us to talk about what's in this new report and what parents, guardians, and educators can do is Amul Kalia from the EFF. Welcome to the show, Amul. Thank you for having me. So last week, a Republican congressman got a lot of flack for saying in reference to privacy changes that nobody had to use the Internet. And not only do most students in public schools have to use the Internet, they also now have to sign up for cloud services. More and more students are getting school issued laptops and tablets, and they're being required to sign up for services like G Suite for Education. I know you talk to a lot of students, parents and educators. What were their biggest concerns about their privacy in schools right now? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. And yeah, that comment from uh, Representative Sensenbrenner, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried not using the internet? Um, <laughs> anyway, getting back on topic. Um, so yeah, schools across the country, whether they're public or private, are rapidly deploying educational technology in our classrooms. And what we've found in the majority of the situations, they're actually doing it without proper consideration for student privacy and security. And this is likely to continue to be a problem as EdTech is actually uh, projected to continue to gain ground. So we hear from different stakeholders, we hear from parents, we hear from administrators, and we hear from students themselves as well. Uh, so I think the biggest group that we have heard from is parents, our parents. Uh, their concern kind of ranged from, they just don't know how to proceed. They're given these sorts of documents and they have you know three days to review them. And in that time, they're supposed to get back to the school. Okay, I agree with this. And a lot of times the documents actually don't provide all the information that they need to see whether or not they should allow their their child to be, uh, you know, allowed to use these new technologies. They're concerned about what kind of data these ad tech companies and applications are collecting and what companies are doing with that data. And, you know, particularly for non-educational and commercial purposes, for instance, product improvement, uh, a lot of these times like vaguely defined and parents just don't know what that entails and what they can do to protect their kids' privacy. And uh, there's just not enough informed consent for companies to be able to do some of the things that they're able to do uh, with these policies. So what options do parents have? I mean, you, you said, you know, get back to us in three days. Is there ever an option to opt out of these services? Yeah, um, so I generally, parents have a lot of power. It's just that a lot of times they just don't know how to exercise it, uh, which is something that we kind of mentioned in our report that we published. Uh, parents should find ways to gain allies locally. I think if you go to a PTA meeting and if you speak up, you're more than likely to find a few other people who will be like, oh yeah, that person's making good points. Like I want to go ahead and, uh, you know, join up with them. A lot of the ways that it works is like, you know, gather a few group of parents and go to the school administrator or go to the, the school board president, the elected representatives, because they are accountable to you. Um, and, you know, demand those opt-outs. Generally, we've found that opt-outs are very rare. Uh, we want them to be more of a thing because rightfully so pe parents are concerned and their concern should be addressed. Uh, Opt-outs can take many forms. Some of them could be using an alternative device. For instance, we heard of a parent who didn't want their child to use a Chromebook, but they were okay with uh, an iPad being used because they were more, much more comfortable with the privacy policy that Apple had put forward. Uh, it could also just include uh, another form of opt-out could just be like not using any educational technology at all without uh, harming their students' education without harming their child's education. So, th and there could also be, you know, basically s schools making sure that there are other plenty of other options without actually impacting the education that the child is receiving. So opt-outs can take many forms and we want to see more of them. Who's the right person to talk to about all this kind of stuff? Because when I think about a lot of, I mean, when I think of privacy and security online, for even those who are firmly entrenched in the security or in the internet, you know, technology world, uh, it can be very confusing. And then you take yep. an organization like education, for example, or, you know, or the classroom. And I mean, there yep. are these tools that are very powerful potentially in protecting, you know, the security and privacy of the students, let's say. Um, but I mean, do... Is, is it the teachers that are supposed to know, like, like have the information as far as being kind of transparent as far as what information they're collecting or how they're protecting the students? Or does it go higher than that? I think uh, so. In our report, we actually go ahead and address all the stakeholders uh, that, that we find in the educational ecosystem. So we address the school district administrators. We address the ed tech companies and we address the teachers themselves. 
And we also addressed librarians and sysadmins. And, you know, basically we were going through the list of all the people uh, who, who are part of this ecosystem. And in terms of teachers, they definitely do have a role. A lot of times we find, not a lot of times, but there were cases where we found out that teachers were actually adding students to or enrolling students in, in these technologies without actually consulting with their parents or without actually telling the districts, uh, which we think is a big no-no. Especially because in that instance, you're basically just taking the the service provider's privacy policy at face value without actually doing any critical analysis of it or making sure that your district is okay with it. Um, and it, and speaking of districts, I think they are the people who actually have the most power in this situation. What districts can demand from service providers is rather than signing uh, you know standard contracts that they're offered but rather making sure that they get customized one that actually addresses their concern. For instance, if they have parents who care about privacy, which of course it's all of them, uh, they should you know, demand contracts that actually address their particular situation and actually spell out all the things that the data can be used for. They have a lot of buying power. These devices are cheap, but, they still, but the ed tech providers still need the district to deploy them. And they need to use this power to make sure that we're able to preserve student privacy. What's the, the one of the biggest ironies to me is that you can't sign up for a Gmail address until you're 13 years old. Like, you know, you would as a parent, if you wanted to get a Gmail address for your child, you'd have to lie and say, you know, that you they were 13. But yet yeah. my 12 year old twins got a Gmail address without my permission. There wasn't, you know, they, it was just through the school. It has, you know, the ending yeah. of, of the school they go to um, and they're told yeah. they can only use it for school purposes. But, you know, it's just like where, where like one hand isn't looking at the other. It seems like very ironic. Yeah, no, that's actually a problem that we raised in the report as well. It's parents should know, like transparency is actually a very big topic in student privacy. A lot of times parents uh, find out that their ch their child have been, their children have been signed up for these services without actually consulting them, without them actually getting adequate notice. So this is actually a pretty big problem. And we hope that, you know, school districts take positive steps to make sure that it actually doesn't happen. And yeah, it's pretty shocking that, you know, your your kids are signed up for these services without you actually having had a chance to vet those privacy policies and see what kind of deal that the district has with the with the service provider. So, yeah, that's, that's shocking. <laughs> and then, I mean, even outside of um, the classroom, you know, it was just a couple of weeks ago that Google announced Family Link, which uh, yeah. is essentially a way of opening accounts for children under 13, kind of in a more official sense. But this is controlled by the parents let's say, does that uh, potentially introduce, I don't know, some of these tracking concerns that you're talking about in this report, but in the home? I mean, there's probably, there's reasons that for the long, for the longest time, I think because of re rule, the COPA rules, uh, that yeah. uh, children under 13 weren't allowed to. Why, why is that different? Yeah, I mean, I'm not too familiar with the family link, pro family link program, so I can't comment too much on that. But we did find... Uh, that by default in the Google education accounts, the G Suite for education accounts that students were being signed up for, by default settings, there was this thing called Chrome Sync that was enabled by default. And that was actually like, uh, you know, collecting a lot of the data. And Google said that this doesn't have to be enabled by default, but we found out that it, like a lot of the schools weren't actually taking the steps that's required to actually going ahead and disabling it. Mm -hmm. And that's actually still one of our biggest points of contention with Google and Chromebooks that are being deployed for education, uh, they say that, you know, we're not using any of this information for advertising purposes, but what they don't say is that we're not collecting any of this information. So I think that's like the nuanced difference. So them saying like, we're not collecting this information for advertising process, but we want them to say, we're not collecting this information. Mm. So, I mean, I know there are lots of parents who work for Google um, who are also concerned about their children's privacy um, and parents that work for other services like this. Is there any self-regulation going on within the industry? Yeah, there is actually. Um, so there's this thing called the Student Privacy Pledge. It's led by two organizations, which is the Future of Privacy Forum and the Software Information Industry Association, or SIA. SIA, if you're fancy. Um, so what the problem with these, with this particular student privacy pledge is, it's how broad the definitions are. Uh, for instance, it says that uh, student personal information, the way that it's defined in the pledge is to allow inform sensitive information to be collected as long as it's not 
linked to a student's personal, personally identifiable information. And uh, we think that that's problematic because this can potentially allow them to, okay, students are looking at, you know, I mean, this is an extreme example, but they're looking at, you know, sexual health sort of issues. Uh, and, you know, a lot of times that's something that you do in private, especially if you're a curious young mind. And we don't want to we don't want to see a system where students are essentially okay with this idea of this data that's being collected on them by companies. So we're like teaching them to be okay with spying at a very young age. And the problem, another problem that I would like to point out with the student privacy pledge is that its definitions are actually way narrower than FERPA, which is the federal law that sort of dictates how uh, student information is collected. And and that's crazy because as we know, we at EFF especially, because we're suing the government, that they're not exactly known for protecting our privacy. So it's ironic that a federal law is actually more uh, protective of student privacy than this self-regulatory uh, sort of student privacy pledge that a lot of these ed tech providers are signing on to. Mm. So we talked a little bit about what parents can do, uh, what teachers can do. What what can students do um, if, a, you know, a students often lead the way? They sometimes know more about privacy than maybe their teachers. What can they do to help ensure their privacy? Yeah, I think students that we have a unique role because they're the people who are affected by these technologies that are being deployed. So I think one of the biggest things that we find is that there's a huge sort of uh, desire amongst the students to just, you know, just kind of fit in and not cause any trouble. We've seen, uh, I talked to one of, this, one of the students who she was particularly concerned, but she also saw that none of her classmates actually cared about this stuff. And she's a high school student actually in Mount View. And, but simultaneously, she, this is something that she had an issue with, but she went ahead and she's like, okay, I'm just going to do it. But, you know, it's with those situations, what students can do is they can actually communicate and talk to their peers. And more importantly, I think they should talk to their parents about it whenever they have these concerns. They need to say, like, I'm being signed up for this service. I don't like it. Or, you know, especially if they're not able to parse out all the privacy policies, what they say. Which, you know, as an adult, even I sometimes have trouble <laughs> parsing those out. Mm -hmm. So they should communicate to their parents, be like, hey, this is what I'm being signed up for. What can I do? They can also talk to their teachers. What does what is the service you're enrolling me for? Have you talked to my parents? Have they consented to this? They can talk to their school administrators. Um, so they have lots of steps. But I think the primary way that they can sort of uh, take action is to, you know, making sure that their parents are informed. And whenever they feel uncomfortable, uh, we think that they should speak up. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Amul Kalia is a, a, a staff member at the EFF, the Electronic F Frontier Foundation, and <laughs> is at Amulionaire on Twitter. Amulionaire. Um, yeah. I love it. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a great day. You, All right, too. you too. Have a good night. All right. Feedback time. Viewer Matt wrote in to tell us why he's a tech dinosaur. Thank you for being so open about this, Matt. Uh, number one, Matt says, my IoT setup consists of mechanical light timers bought from Home Depot. Number two, my phone is a Samsung Convoy 4 feature phone. Number three, I used 40 megabytes of cell data last month. I have a two gigabyte plan. Uh, four, I don't do social media. And five, I have under 10 online accounts. And finally, six, Matt says, my entertainment comes from either my iPad, uh, my iPod Classic. I almost gave him more credit with an iPad there. <laughs> iPod. My iPod Classic or my four-year-old cat. I would add a seven and that that goes counter to all of this. And that's that you're a fan of tech news today. Mm -hmm. And you must, you know, you must be a little bit less of a tech dinosaur because you're following this show. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, do you remember, I remember when I would sync podcasts with oh, yeah. my iPod and oh, it was yeah. just like this, uh, drag uh -huh, it, drop you plug it, it in, <laughs> wait for the sync before you run out the door, you get out the door, then you go to play it and you realize the one didn't sync that you needed and you're like, dang it. Yeah. Is it's that like you really? Lost, it's like you left the house without your keys. Yeah. That's really how you listen to us, Matt. I need to know if there's another way that you're listening or if that's really by syncing to the yeah. iPod classic. I mean, it's got a Samsung Convoy 4 feature phone. Like, I don't know that phone specifically, but oh. maybe it doesn't play media or sync yeah. any data or anything yeah. like that. Uh, yeah. Hey, the iPod classic is still a great... I still have know, some. I, I have. I still have an iPod classic, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, TNT's fan of the day... I do not know if TNT's fan of the day watches us on an iPod classic. Uh, he is, he or she is basic Rowan on Twitter who sent us this picture saying this is how uh, 
He watches, yeah, listens. He listens to TNT. He is a guy, Jason says. At any rate, drawing a bad girl commission for a friend's daughter. That is awesome. I know. Look at that. Super talented. <laughs> My goodness. He is a project manager by day, web cartoonist by night after the kids go to bed. So That's thank awesome. you. Show us how you watch or listen to TNT. There's no shame in however you watch or listen. Just record a video, take a picture of yourself or your setup, post it on Instagram, Google+, Twitter, or Facebook. Use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT and we will find it. Yeah, I love that. That's really good art. Uh, Tumblr decided that you need help. There you are being all pitiful when you watch your YouTube videos all alone. So Tumblr to the rescue with the release of Cabana by Tumblr that finally lets you, finally lets you share a digital couch with up to six other friends while you watch YouTube videos together in sync. And you know, you can virtually hang out. It's kind of like, it, actually looking at some of the screenshots of it kind of reminds me of House Party, mm -hmm. which was uh, done by the Meerkat folks last year. Kind of the multi, you know, uh, Every, everyone's video is on the same screen in a grid-like, you know, Brady Bunch fashion. But in this case, you've got a YouTube video playing up at the top and you're all watching the same thing. And you're all looking, of course, at your phone so everybody sees each other's face because you're all looking at the camera and... I don't know. Do you know what it reminds me of? What? Uptime, the exact same app that came out last week or two weeks ago or three weeks ago from YouTube, which is lets you also sit around and watch YouTube why, videos together. Why did Tumblr think they needed to do I don't this? know. Like, Because <laughs> huh. uh, Uptime, I might have been invitation only. Um, no, you guys join me there if you can, because I posted some videos. That's where. That's why I posted, if you were watching before the show, you saw that um, I posted the my favorite video in the whole wide world, which is about Loka, uh, the pug that can't run. Uh -huh. And I posted yes. that and just to, you know, it's kind of like what we do before the show. We watch YouTube videos together. <laughs> that's true. Um, it's awesome. So. Okay. Um, yeah. And I don't think you would be sharing a virtual couch. You're sharing a virtual cabana, right? I don't know. They also said couch. Mm. So well, I think, you know, they have their, cabana. They, they like have their shade. thing. I'd like some shade while I'm watching Maybe videos. there's a couch inside the cabana that you're okay. all sitting down okay. on and you're all That's staring true. at a single phone. That's true. Because um, a cabana, yeah, you'd have to sit on something inside the cabana. Yeah, exactly. I'm a might fan well of cabanas. So I might try this. Just <laughs> a fan of, of cabanas? I am. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right. Uh-oh. Uh -oh. Burke has something to say. He says, this made me die a little inside. Burke's so jaded. People should interact in the real world more. Says the man who communicates by index card <laughs> in a video podcast. Ah, Megan got you, bro. <laughs> Megan, that was good. Uh, TNT records live every Monday through Friday as he tears it away. Monday through Friday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern, 2300 UTC at twit.tv slash live. You can be part of the show by emailing us. TNT at twit.tv. Leave us a short voicemail, of course, 260 TNT show. And find us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You might not know this, but Twit's triangulation episode with Edward Snowden's lawyer is up for a Webby Award. You can vote. We would like you to vote to make sure it wins. And then more people can see our network. More people can see triangulation. Go to twit.tv, twit.to yes. slash Webby 2017. I'll say that again since I said it wrong the first time. Twit.to, the letter O, like slash two. Webby 2017, that's 2017, uh, to vote. Do it now. The deadline is Thursday. And subscribe to our show if you haven't already. Go to twit.tv slash TNT and subscribe for a friend who may not know they would enjoy us, but you know they will. And if you want to tweet at me, I'm at Megan Maroney. And I'm at Jason Howell. Thanks to our technical director, Brian Burnett, of course. Thanks to Burke for helping out in the studio and being curmudgeonly from time to time. We really appreciate it. Uh, thanks to Ke Josh for editing the show, and thanks to you for talking tech with us today. Uh, Megan, we'll see you tomorrow. I will not. I will not be here. But we'll still high-five right now. Uh, uh, Josh is editing the episode today. Oh. What did I say? No, he just said Kevin. Kevin's in Hawaii or something. Of this stuff. Or he's in the, he's <laughs> right, riding he flying turtles yeah. somewhere. Sharks. Okay, so I'm going to say the word Josh and just take the audio from Josh and put it over me <laughs> mouthing so, Kevin. He can decide what he wants to do.